Let's look at Jacob Lawrence's work, especially his migration series, migration of the Negro series, because we want to understand why his art is so significant and what it tells us about art around 1940, kind of moving from the 30s into what then becomes a new turning point of the 40s that we will be following up on. So the migration of the Negro series. In this series, he revives history painting in a radically new and powerful way for the 20th century. In 60 painted panels that work together as a sweeping drama moving sequentially, he confronts one of history's most profound stories of human struggle against oppression and a journey to liberation, the multi-decade mass movement of African Americans from rural Jim Crow South to the urban North starting around 1915. Each painting also presents a text caption, as in the case of this one, they were very poor. A very brief caption but very powerful in its brevity, just as the artwork uses brevity and simplicity to amplify and magnify the emotional significance of what's being told, what's being shown. So the art is both visual and literary. So this is a very serious and ingenious revival of history painting. Like Jericho, Lawrence is doing deep research. He used a book that had been published in 1920 by the writer Emmett Scott, which was titled Migration of the Negro, because he wanted to distill into this series very important factual insights. So this one is captioned in many places because of the war, food had doubled in price. He's just as concerned with the veracity of the history as he is with the emotional power of his representations and the visual freshness of his style. So this one is captioned, the railroad stations were at times so overpacked with people leaving that special guards had to be called in order to keep order. So he's juxtaposing a sociological prose with a visual poetry. And we'll talk about how that visual poetry is so dazzling and effective because Lawrence is thinking about digesting and bringing into the mix all sorts of ideas from avant-garde modernism to, um, to Harlem Renaissance principles and artistic models to ideas that are floating around in the WPA. Lake Corbet. Jacob Lawrence is committed to art that wants to elevate the subjugated classes. It's interesting that he chooses, like Corbet, to mask the individual identities of many of his figures. This expresses the sense that their individuality is being trampled by this systematic injustice bearing down on them. Also that the art is representing a struggle that goes beyond an individual, a struggle that concerns an entire group, the destiny of a people. Lawrence formed his artistic vision between about 1938 and 1940 by engaging deeply with ideas from avant-garde modernism, the WPA Federal Art Project, and the immense vitality of African American culture that had been flowering in the Ren Harlem Renaissance of the 20s and beyond. Lawrence was one of many artists who were part of the WPA Federal Art Project, founded in 1934. We're looking at the Smithsonian Am Am Museum of American Art, um, their exhibition online dating 1934, the commencement of what they call a New Deal for Artists. So that project, the Federal Art Project, stimulated a surge of interest in history painting and also in what was called the American scene, meaning that artists were really going to pay close attention to the texture of life in America. America would be the reference point, not the European high culture tradition. And so if you look at the image gallery here at the Smithsonian, you see the kind of images of American art that were interesting to artists and that those artists felt would speak to the public in the 30s, in the time of the Depression. So certainly this meant an interest in ordinary people, everyday people, and everyday activities, right? 
going to the barbers, the barber shop, or do you call it the hairdresser or the barber shop? I don't know. But going to an ordinary, everyday event of having your hair cut, but also landscapes, rural, as well as urban, and having them be recognizably of a particular place. So what was very interesting to many artists at the time was regionalism, the character of a region, the character of the people of that region. And along with that was a sense that history was related to certain regions, that the, the character of the people was related to the places where they lived. So all of these WPA ideas and examples fed into Lawrence's work. But he took the idea of history more seriously. He knew it was urgent for African Americans. It was not just some golden past. And he was much more inventive artistically than most of his peers that we see. Most WPA artists, that, such as we're seeing here, oh, it's not popping up there. They were committed to what was called at the time social realism. It was the buzzword. Rivera was the great example of a social realist, and he inspired so many. S social realism was about the idea that the artwork needed to deal with the social reality of the times to show people in their social environments. And the realism was connected to the idea that realism was the art for the masses. There was a widespread claim made that avant-gardism was too strange for the masses, that to tell the story of the ordinary people, they would need the familiar style of realism. Snow shovelers, a very realistic image of them trudging through the snow, doing their work. So even though Lawrence shared Rivera's desire to make an encyclopedic history of a people, he rejected social realism and he called his style dynamic cubism. Lawrence engaged with the avant-garde spatial dynamics of cubism. And this marvelous scene shows that the men playing pool, it's a thrilling crisscross of diagonal lines, flat shapes and sharp angles that simultaneously suggest spatial depth and cancel it out, just like a painting by Brock or Picasso. So edges thrust forward, colors pop across the surface. The balls are wonderfully kinetic in their scattered repetition. Lorenz uses the sophisticated spatial games of Picasso and Brock's cubism, but he doesn't just imitate cubism. He makes it his own with his play of pattern and depth, movement and structure. So Lorenz is reinventing abstraction in a sophisticated way. He's exploiting the expressive potential of abstraction. That's different than what Mondrian thought he was doing in sort of distilling out everything but the essential fundamental primary colors and geometry. For Lawrence, we get a tenement apartment building, the kind you see in northern cities like New York and Chicago, where the poor people live, the workers. And you get those buildings, the browns, the blue-gray, and you have a syncopated rhythm of primary colors, which is sort of playful and very fun, but it's also a sense that this geometric spirit of the modern world that has been promised by the avant-garde, this is rather different for those living in the cold apartments in the city who are barely eking out a living. Lawrence's art bridges so many different cultural streams. That's part of what makes it so powerful. He gained the basis of his artistic education at the Harlem Art Center, which was established by this woman, Augusta Savage, an accomplished sculptor who worked in the realist mode that was so popular in the 30s because it was associated with an art of the people. And you can see that here with her figural tableau. 
She, however, really felt that her, her most important contribution was her art center, her Harlem art center that she had started and which trained so many children and so many artists. She was Jacob Lawrence's first significant mentor. Another of his mentors was the painter Charles Alston, who in 1936 received a major WPA commission to direct a series of murals at Harlem Hospital Center. And Lawrence's future wife, Gwendolyn Knight, was one of the painters working on those murals. Lawrence helped Alston transfer those, transfer drawings for those murals to the walls. Lawrence, I would argue, went beyond what those mentors were able to do, though. He was more experimental, he was more inventive, and he was more able to fuse the the desire to tell a story of social relevance with an abstraction that was very expressive and very much still an art of the people. So we see here, I'm comparing his figures to the figures that we see in the German Expressionists where kind of the pressures and social pathologies of life are seen on the bodies of the people and in the way the figures are rendered. And in arriving at that vision, Jacob Lawrence was helped by having another mentor, um, which is his, his peer, but also mentor, Aaron Douglas, whose New York Public Library WPA murals titled Aspects of Negro Life show us this notion that we can have a history of a people, that we can be told a story that is engaging and it's legible, but it's not realist. It's not social realist. It's full of wonderful kind of beams of light cutting through in a kind of a cubist fashion. The figures are turned into kind of silhouettes, simplified in a way that makes them kind of dreamlike. It makes them more than a kind of a real individual person. It makes them become an emblem or an archetype of the spiritual life that he is wanting to express. If we look at Douglas's mural with all of its dancing, its kind of visionary quality, its rhythmic quality of drumming being expressed through the rhythmic interplay of the figures in a circular form, we see a sculpture here, an African sculpture. And both Douglas and Lawrence were very consciously reclaiming back from an artist like Picasso the heritage of African masks, which had been called primitivist by the Europeans. And yes, they did that often in really quite a, a way of paying homage to what they saw as the power of them. And yet that was always infused with racism. And so we have with Douglas and with Lawrence, we have a sense of the so-called primitive being shown as a kind of a splendidly expressive statement so that the painted forms are almost carved like a mask into very firm planes that pack of a kind of intensity and vitality into seemingly simple forms. And Lawrence said, quote, if at times my productions do not express the conventionally beautiful, there is always an effort to express the universal beauty of man's continuous struggle to lift his social position and to add dimension to his spiritual being. I think this is very insightful, that he needed a language that was bigger than social realism, because he's seeing the struggle, the historical, the social, the political struggle that he's representing, he's seeing it as also having a spiritual dimension. And what's amazing is that he actually forged a visual language that works on all of those levels. And going forward, he is the visionary pointing the way ahead because artists are going to be very concerned with abstraction as an expressive, psychological, spiritual form which is going to be a new kind of American emphasis.